What's up guys? Uh, this is Chris from Shrimpery on Instagram. I want to make a quick little video talking about how to create a pond tank, like the ones that you see right here. Um, it's a really easy and rewarding style of aquarium to set up. Um, I'm surprised more people don't make them and I would love to see it grow in popularity. So here's my quick little guide. I really hope that you enjoy and thanks for watching. So I think it's really good to choose a shallow tank shape. Um, I use an Altum Nature System 60S tank here. Um, and the reason is you really wanna get a good surface area to volume ratio so that you can show off what's going on at the surface of the water, um, which is really the pond plants here. And you know, when I'm making a tank like this, I really want it to look as natural as possible. Um, and it's just a lot easier to do that when you have a shallow tank as opposed to a deep tank. Something's really off about the proportions in a deep tank and uh, it's just hard to get that natural look. So I want to create a little tiny slice of like a pond or the side of a stream. And if you think about it, those plants are always growing out of a sloped sort of soil section um, that's going into the water and sloping down. So that's what I do in the back of my tanks. Um, I think about it like two concentric rectangles, one smaller rectangle being pushed towards the back right or back left of the other larger rectangle, which is obviously the tank. And then going off of that, uh, you can sort of delineate the land section, quote unquote, or, you know, emergent plant section and the um, underwater section clearly. So the mounded substrate is held in place by a scaffold of um, driftwood, maybe a few rocks here and there that will act as a skeleton to hold everything together and keep it from spilling out um, into the rest of the tank. Um, so I don't waste a lot of substrate. The first layer is something like, you know, crushed lava rock, something expendable. And then on top of that, I'll put a pretty thick layer of something like UNS Contra soil, like an enriched aqua soil type substrate. And then I'll go back and add more moss or whatever to fill in the holes so that uh, the soil doesn't spill out when I fill the tank. Um, and then from there I plant the plants. I'll get into plant selection, but key when planting the plants is just to pick, um, you know, plants that will do well in a condition like this. So the goal is to have the plants, you know, planted pretty densely. Um, so you have like this thick, richly planted bank. If it's planted sporadically, it'll look kind of weird. Um, and you know, you want to start dense. So they'll just keep growing more and more dense with time. That'll look good right off the bat. Um, I also like to have a few pieces of driftwood sticking out of the water here and there. I think that creates some nice visual interest and it gives a nice little area for fish to swim around, um, kind of mimicking the conditions you might see in nature. Um, and you know, that adds more vertical height. For a tank like this, you really need something hanging above the tank in terms of a light fixture. Um, here I have a UNS Titan light fixture. Really powerful light, uh, tons and tons of LEDs, and you know, it's high above the tank, but as you can see, everything is growing just fine because it's so bright. A lot of people message me and ask if it's possible to not have a filter in a tank like this, but it's really best to have a nice canister filter like this Eheim 2211. You can use like um, lily pipes that hang over the side. Basically one sucks water out, one pushes water in. And when you do that, make sure you have something like this spin outflow that mitigates the flow. A lot of um, pond plants and animals that you might use don't really like strong current, um, but you'll still get good water turnover due to the volume of the filter. In the submerged portion of the tank, I like to have a sandy foreground. Please don't use pool filter sand because it looks pretty unnatural and will discolor quickly, but use something that's a little bit more natural colored. Maybe also some river rocks or something like that. And you can create like a dedicated fish area for them to swim around in. And then coming off the slope that we discussed earlier, you can have plants that will be underwater, but might also poke out of the water a little bit. Um, so you can have something like dwarf hair grass, Monte Carlo, um, easier stem plants like Ludwigia. Plenty of rotalas will grow well in a tank like this. And you can have that sloping up to the true emergent plants. Um, you know, the pond plants that uh, we talked about and you can plant those super densely so that their roots will be um, contributing to the uh, biomass of the aquatic plants. Just to run through um, some of my favorite plant species that I use, at left, sticking out of the water at kind of an angle, you can see purple bamboo. Um, I also have like a main grass mound in this tank that is 
made up of Japanese blood grass, blue rush, white top sedge, and cotton grass. Um, at right, you can see a Louisiana iris. And then in front of that, the leafy plant is water celery. I also have some spherocarum planted in there and then uh, going down to some floating plants. This is the uh, Japanese blood grass. Um, really colorful, cool, unique grass to grow. It honestly prefers wet soil, but it'll also grow with um, maybe like half an inch of water. Any deeper than that, it won't really spread like you can see it's doing here, but it should still survive. Um, but it's a really cool one to try. One really cool thing about water celery is that it can grow pretty deep. So um, here you can see it's growing in a few inches of water um, and it spreads really rapidly once it gets established, um, especially if you trim it frequently. White top sedge is really cool because it forms these white flowers. Um, that one's probably gonna pop up in a week or so. Um, it doesn't like super deep water, but it spreads pretty quickly. Um, it's not as crazy as the blood grass. Sphaerocarum is a really cool plant to use. Um, it's actually a grass, but it doesn't look super grass-like. Uh, here are some photos of it in my tanks. It looks like um, it can form almost like a bush uh, if you trim it frequently. So what I do is I plant it kind of interspersed throughout the other plants. And by trimming, replanting, trimming, replanting, I can eventually get this like dense bush. Um, it almost looks like a topiary hedge sticking out of the water. Um, and it's a really cool plant because it can grow underwater or above water um, at pretty much any depth or height. So uh, if you can get your hands on it, I would really recommend it. Um, it's useful for uh, tanks that are gonna have like fry or um, baby shrimp because they can go and hide amongst the tiny little leaves and stuff in the shoreline. Um, and it just adds like a nice structure and dimension to your tank that you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, it's really cool to see like the shadowed areas and uh, also the other plants sticking out between the leaves. It's good to do a lot of research before buying the plants you want to use um, because you want to think about how deep do the plants like to be planted in terms of like how deep are they in the water. Um, so some plants like to grow pretty deeply in the water and most of the pond plants we use in like um, a garden are pretty different in their needs compared to like aquarium plants, which can be planted at any depth and will eventually grow out of the water. But a lot of pond plants, for example, this is white top sedge. They like to be in um, a more shallow depth, maybe half an inch uh, to an inch or so, white top sedge does at least. But if you put in those conditions, like you see in this tank that I have here, it was flowering and stuff like that. Here's water celery, it can actually grow at a pretty deep depth and still stick out of the water. Um, I've had it grow at like eight inches and come out of the water still. Um, so you just wanna do your research and find out what a particular plant needs in terms of planting depth. If you're wondering where to get these plants, um, you can search by their scientific name online, whatever ones you want. And you can usually find them on eBay or from like aquatic nurseries, that sort of stuff. Um, also aquarium stores. With floating plants, you want to choose um, things that aren't gonna be too large. So I, I would say water hyacinth isn't a good choice, but red root floater, duckweed, something like that. Um, you can do dwarf water lilies. Make sure they're dwarf water lilies and not massive water lilies. Um, and you know, even without CO2, due to the surface area to volume ratio in a shallow tank, Monte Carlo, dwarf harrowgrass, moss, they'll all take off and um, you know, they'll blend into a nice little shoreline that uh, the fish and shrimp have a fun time hanging out in. In terms of livestock, think about scale. Um, you want things that aren't gonna be too big. So dwarf shrimp are a good choice. Um, I would say they're a good choice in any tank that doesn't have aggressive fish. Um, but they breed really easily and uh, they're a lot of fun. Um, I like to keep uh, Japanese rice fish. They're really cool kind of rare in the US, um, really hardy fish that don't require a heater. So they kind of require similar conditions to like a goldfish or other cold water fish. Um, and they breed super easily. So if you get them, you'll soon be removing eggs um, and you know, little tiny fry you spot. And I've actually kept multiple generations. Um, and at this point, all my rice fish were born in my own tanks, which is pretty cool. 
except for one I think might be like a OG rice fish that, uh, you know, is probably one of the parents of a lot of the other fish. If you can't get your hands on rice fish, um, you could do something like mosquito fish or least killifish or some other small um, rapidly breeding fish. Um, just so you have more of a dynamic environment. And actually what's really cool about doing a tank like this is the dense plants at the shoreline give more opportunities for fry to survive. So although I try to remove fry and eggs when I spot them and put them in like a uh, you know fry tank to let them grow up, I've even had fish born and raised in a particular tank that just managed to avoid predation from the adults and grew to full size um, just due to how densely planted the shoreline is in a tank like this. So something to think about, um, if you added a heater, you could also do any number of, you know, tropical fish, whatever. But uh, I kind of like the more temperate biome sort of thing I got going on in mine. I like to keep the water pretty soft. So I shoot for a pH around, you know, seven to 6.5 something like that. And then I'll do um, a lower GH and KH. Um, I think key is just having water not being too hard because a lot of plants don't like harder water. Um, and then as the water evaporates, I top off with RODI water. I have a RODI filter. They're actually not very expensive. You can order them online for like 70 bucks. Um, and you can just attach it to your sink so it doesn't have to be like a permanent part of your life. And uh, essentially once you have like a, a little bit of evaporation, you can just top off with pure water. Um, you top off with pure water as opposed to like sink water in order to ensure that the osmolarity is maintained because as the water evaporates, only the water evaporates as opposed to the ions in the water. And if you just keep adding more and more ions while the water just keeps evaporating, eventually you'll just have water that's not very good for either the fish or the plants. I always make sure to do a 30% water change twice a week in a tank like this. Um, it doesn't have CO2, so it doesn't need as much trimming as like a high-tech tank would, but my plants definitely benefit from me trimming away dead leaves or, um, you know, disease looking growth. And then that way new healthier growth can come back in its place. Um, but back to the water changes, I actually use uh, RODI water that I remineralize with salty shrimp GHKH and that's just like a powder you can buy online but it allows you to ensure that you have consistent water parameters in your tank prior to adding the water to the tank. When it comes to fertilizer a lot of people ask me about this. Um, all I use is Tropica Specialized. It's like an all-in-one complete fertilizer. It has macros and micros um, and I just dose like half a pump so I, I kind of go like that. I, I press down on this and I don't press all the way. Um, and I do that after each 30% water change. Um, and that's really all I add in terms of fertilizer and the plants are really happy with it. Um, obviously having an enriched substrate, I mentioned I have UNS contra soil in here, um, also helps the plants grow. If your tank ever gets too overgrown, um, don't be afraid to do a hard trim, trim everything back and uh, it'll all come back um, after that. And it'll look like new and fresh. So that's kind of what happened in this picture I'm showing you. I did a hard trim and everything sprouted back up. All right, well, that's my guide to creating a pond tank. Um, pretty straightforward, but uh, really rewarding. And uh, I hope that I've inspired you to make one of your own. Um, if you have any questions, comments, whatever, don't forget to leave them in the comment section. And uh, you can also message me on my Instagram, Shrimpery. Thanks for watching.